Uh, now with this, did, I I don't know how you want to do this I, since you're recording it rather than doing it live. Um, do you have like a little intro you do? Do you want me to be quiet for that, or are you just no, gonna put I, it in I post? Honestly, the 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 purpose of this was it, it's like I, there's a lot of people who are interested in just listening, and I feel like I I want to have a conversation with you, and I feel like that is the best way to go about it. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just. Starting at like, I don't know, I feel like it's very contrived to be like, What's up guys, it's me, Wacky James, once again, back with another person. Yeah, I, <laughs> it, just kind of, it seems kind of stupid. I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to preface this uh, with, I was taking a shit before this, and I was, uh, that's why I was taking so long. I, 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 but, uh, outside of the uh, audio issues that I was having, I, I, was, uh, I was watching this uh, little, little Facebook video about uh, some sweaty antifas. Uh, like crowding around this guy um, in Boston. I guess there's a uh, Boston Free Speech rally, and he he asked them. He just asked. He just asked his group of women, "Why why should I join your movement?" And like like clockwork, it seems like they all were just looked at him like, "Are you kidding me?" That was and a one, guy with a GoPro right on his shoulder. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I've the, seen the, that one. Yeah, with the, with the sw the smelly. Uh, you could smell. You could smell the purple hair. Like, it's just, it looks gross. She's like, it's the right thing to do. I, what is, uh, like, when you first discovered the Antifa movement, like, what did you, what did, what was your, like, your takeaway initially? Uh, well, I mean, with, like, Antifa, especially with, like, the Black Bloc uh, in Europe and, well, mostly in Europe. I mean, my first encounter with really what they were was uh, seeing the reaction to, like, G20, G8, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, when they would just wreak havoc on the area. It was almost like the police were so used to the rodeo and the uh the sideshow of it that they didn't really care anymore they just let them go around breaking shit and burning stuff right uh that was my first encounter with them and then we saw that kind of migrate over here i mean we always had antifa but the more i guess violent or active members of it uh, which would be like black block that kind of stuff we didn't really see kind of kick off until maybe once people thought trump would have the republican nomination mm -hmm. uh and then it kind of just exploded it grew on itself uh, that that was my first exposure to them and my thoughts on them. I, I don't like them, and I don't I don't think a lot of other groups that uh, aren't necessarily opposed to what they might stand for like them either. Uh, you see that with um, a lot of liberals that encounter them. Uh, they'll yeah. say you know they'll say Democrats get the bullet too to them right mm -hmm. you know point blank. Uh, also you know yesterday in Dallas because there were there were rallies everywhere. Uh, last night in Dallas, uh, BLM was holding a, a protest and Antifa Black Bloc people came in. And the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter people were like, get out of here. We don't want to associate with you. You need to get out. And uh, they wouldn't leave. They started a confrontation with uh, one of the Black Lives Matter uh, speakers. And he's like, you need to go take the mask off. We're not about that. And he punches him. The Antifa guy punches him <laughs> right in the face. And then after he does that, before BLM can react, they all start chanting, we come in peace. We come in peace. <laughs> And so I, it, it, that's a crazy thing about Antifa, I, you know, especially with the black bloc guys, they don't really mesh well with anybody. I don't, I don't even think people that are necessarily on their side of the political spectrum like them because everywhere they go, they start shed and every group they interact with, they become, you know, kind of violent about. It. And you can see that with like just, again, basic liberals that are out to do their side of whatever a protest is or right. a specialized groups like Black Lives Matters. When they encounter them, it's they, they just don't want to be associated with it either because they know it's going to be a headache, that they're going to be there doing stuff that they don't necessarily agree with. And they, they did the same stuff they do at um, every rally, which is take like a bullhorn, put it up to your ear, and then blast it on full effect. And <laughs> I don't um, even think they know what they stand for. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like some really weird pseudo-anarchist uh, ideology of wanting the world to burn and break down systems and we don't like authority of any kind the cops yeah, are bad yeah, the yeah but, bad. but why but why uh, uh because <laughs> okay all right well uh, you got me oh right, well if you get one of them talking for long enough usually it breaks down to yeah it's anti-authoritarian but they they can't like, they can't uh, differentiate between authoritarian and authority so right. anything that has any kind of power over them is bad so it goes back to like the old libertarian joke of who will build the roads. Like they want some weird chaotic society where nobody's really um, in charge of anything, in charge of anything. And nobody has authority over anybody. But when you're in that kind of situation, it's just pure chaos. And, you know, how do you protect yourself and your community and everything else? And uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy stuff. It, it seems it seems like they model a perfect world based off of what they've seen in like a uh, 
what what would be to us a an apocalyptic you know postmodern society i feel like they don't really know what they stand for or what <laughs> they want but they just want everything to be like you know you pay in you pay in uh pennies that were made from bottle caps and nobody really tells you shit you don't have to shower ever you don't have to do anything ever is uh, cuz nobody no nobody controls what i do yeah it, it's yeah it, it's I, I guess the easiest way to look at it would be um, they're kind of like they're hipster suburbanite kids. They're usually in their 20s to 30s. They're usually white, usually from affluent families, usually from an educated background. I mean, that that's your general demographic of what Antifa Black Bloc is. And they always talk about how they hate authority and they hate uh, anything over them and they think society's wretched and falling apart, but they've never really encountered hardships. <laughs> like it, it, it's like this ideology that doesn't connect to them on a real level, and so that's why I think their actions are so cartoonish, because they're they're reacting how they think they should react rather than how a real person would, and so they go out there and they become extra violent, and they become extra destructive, and it's just this weird disconnect. I look at them almost no differently than I look at like a uh, a teenage girl on Tumblr talking about her headmates. You know, it's all playing <laughs> it's all playing pretend for the attention. Right. They they like the idea of the cool rebel fighting against the system you know they have this idea that they're living in the 60s where they've got some real cause to fight for but <laughs> that time has passed and they have nothing to grasp onto so they're bitching about nothing at the end living in seattle for the last uh shit it's been three years actually to the day that i've been here and i feel like if i were to say something uh racially ambiguous let's put it that way if i were to say something that would be questionable in the eyes of somebody who uh takes offense to things I, i'd be more likely like if i were to parade around you know downtown seattle saying the n-word i'd probably get the shit beat out of me out of me by like a, a white guy a white kid some white kid in his 20s that's studying liberal arts down here in uh you know evergreen college then some black dude getting upset about the fact that somebody said the n-word you know i feel like uh it's it's a movement that it's a it's an every every man's movement you know everybody can grasp onto the same idea um, not really know too much about it. Uh, feel like they're a part of something. Like, look at me. I did something for social change. That was me. Like, okay. At the end of the day, what's really getting done? Uh, you look like an asshole on live TV. I feel like national television kind of broadcasts all these kids uh, in a very, very accurate way. You know, a bunch of, like you said, you know, 20 to 30 year old kids we don't really know what the fuck's going on, just breaking shit in the name of, quote, social justice. Well, it's it's really hard to take an anarchist seriously when they're wearing skinny jeans and they've got an iPad. You know, it doesn't really mesh well with the anarchist, uh, you know, <laughs> lifestyle that they're trying to project. Um, right. But yeah, yeah, they usually take offense for other groups. And I think that's part of the reason why in Dallas BLM got so upset, because they know what they're about. They're yeah. all, you know, they didn't want to be co-opted. You know, I'm, I have disagreements with BLM, but... At sure. least BLM had enough foresight to be able to, you know, spot them and be like, get the fuck away. We, we don't want any association with you because you're not going to come in here and hijack what we're trying to talk about and make it some kind of weird anarcho, you know, communist uh, platform for yourself. Now, um, were, are, were you f familiar with the uh, Philadelphia Police Department uh, from like the 40s to the 60s? No, know? no, not, not at all. So uh, my grandfather was a part of uh, the... What was it? Uh, Darlington County PD back in 1958. And he said that uh, a lot of the cops there were incredibly racist. They would beat, they would literally just pull black dudes out of their, uh, out of their like establishments and beat the shit out of them and just for no reason. And I, I feel like, I feel like that, that does, that couldn't happen in a modern society as much as people say it does, which is why I had such a hard time uh, grasping the actual movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and I, I, not that I necessarily agree with the level of, you know, racism that they're subjected to. I, I do feel like there is probably some legitimate concern, um, but it, I feel, I, I feel like at the end of the day, when you when you try to get yourself on a public platform to speak about something um, important and you have uh, a, a loud minority yelling, it, it ruins your movement. Uh, just like if, you know, uh, Trump protesters were in their little uh, huddle outside of a, a Boston establishment screaming, fuck Trump. It's like, okay, well, you lump those guys together 
Uh, maybe that's not necessarily reflective of the whole movement, but that's what people are going to see. Same thing with like, uh, you know, going to the monument the, in Charlottesville. You get people that get lumped together and then all of a sudden your your it's almost like your whole movement becomes uh, illegitimate at that point because you get lumped together with the one stereotype. So what do you think about the like the Black Lives Matter movement? Do you do you believe that their their claims are or not their claims, but their their uh, concerns are legitimate or do you kind of think like eh, maybe it's maybe it's not as bad as they say it is? I think my viewpoint on Black Lives Matter is reflective of their inability to choose a suitable martyr. And what I okay. mean by that is the cases they select usually involve individuals that were involved in some kind of criminal activity mm-hmm. or something that led up to the confrontation where the individual got shot or killed. Right. Um, I think it's a, an issue with them in particular with optics. You know, they, they pick mm-hmm. somebody that uh, was involved in something, they get killed, they immediately uh, protest that as some sign of uh, police racism or violence. I can give you an example from uh, Minnesota, where I'm from, mm-hmm. uh, Jamar Clark. Jamar Clark was uh, somebody they picked. They said, hey, this guy was basically brutally executed by the police. They put him down on his knees and they shot him in the back of the head for the fun of it. Now, what ended up happening as this went on was it came out that Jamar Clark uh, had a previous incident where he stole a car. He drove it like 30 miles an hour into a building. Mm-hmm. And then when the police came to arrest him, Uh, He claimed that they were beating him unjustly and they were racist and all of this stuff. Well, he was unaware of the fact that a camera was on him the whole time and the police never did any of that. So fast forward a couple of months and he's beating uh, some female associate, his girlfriend or somebody he knew, uh, as she was trying to be brought into a ambulance. So the police show up on scene uh, to deal with him and he basically reaches for one of their guns and that's what, you know, ended up leading to it. Now, all the accounts from the witnesses saying that the police, you know, handcuffed him, put him on his knees, and then shot him in the head turned out to be false because they had video from witnesses that were involved. Right. Um, and, and that's just another case. But that led to a month and a half, two months of protesting. And during that two months, you know, when this was going on, they were, you know, uh, damaging property, mm-hmm. uh, blocking off uh, roadways, getting violent with the police. Jamar Clark's brother was out there saying he supported ISIS and they should start killing anybody that disagrees with them. He was like, I'm down with ISIS. Um, and so it's a big PR thing, right? If you're going to go out and try to talk to the general public and sway them to your cause and say that, okay, uh, there is racism in law enforcement and it needs to be addressed, then you need to pick people that were really honest to God, unjustly dealt with. That somebody who was shot for no reason something terrible that happened. And when you protest it, you've got to do it in a way where you're not destroying your own neighborhoods. I mean, a lot of the time what you see is they talk about how racist uh, law enforcement is or how bad society is, but then they go into their own neighborhood and they're looting their own stores and they're burning down their own shit. And, uh, you know, we saw that with uh, what happened in, oh my God, I can't even remember where it was. Uh, Yeah, they had the sister of somebody who got shot on there. And she, she actually said, we need, I, I, this is like a direct quote, or it's really close to verbatim. You can look it up. But she said on the TV, we need our weaves, go burn down white people neighborhoods, which again, I don't agree with. You shouldn't be burning down anybody's neighborhoods, but at least she had some sense in the fact that why are you destroying the, the, your, the place that you live? You're only hurting uh, black business owners and people from your own neighborhood. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's my take on it. I, I think if they were better at presenting their case and they were better at um, protesting the way they did, maybe they'd have a shot. But so far, all they've done is bring up people that turn out to have some kind of criminal record or were getting violent with the police or something crazy was going on. And then the protest that follows usually is violent. And there's a lot of anti-white sentiment uh, with their protest. So, you know, as a white guy, it's hard to connect to it, right? Why, why would it connect to me if you're, if you're telling me I'm the devil, basically? Oh, I, I'm shoving a camera in a cop's face and he punches it out. Look, look what this cop did. Look, all cops are scum. And it gets shared 7 million times on Facebook and on Twitter. And it's like, look at this scumbag piece of shit cop that is doing this X horrible thing or, you know, or doing Y. It's just, it, it, it's, it's simple point and click outrage. You know, you, if you can find something that tugs on the, um, you know, the heartstrings of stupid people, then stupid people gather without actually taking, uh, you know, the time to actually, uh, look into what's actually going on. Right. I mean, cops deal with a lot of bullshit. Um, that's not to say that all cops are great. Any any profession that you look at is always going to have one or two assholes in it, right? It doesn't matter yeah. what the profession is. 
It becomes an issue when the asshole has authority, obviously, and has access to weapons and can fine you and jail you. So, I mean, I get that. But, but on the whole, I don't think most police officers, when they go through the program and become a police officer, are thinking to themselves, now I get to oppress people. <laughs> I, I, I think they're thinking to themselves, either the job pays well, or I want to protect my community, or they have some mm -hmm. kind of personal reason for going into it. I don't think it's some you know, malicious intent on their part to get authority to, pe no. you know, to suppress people. Um, you know, our, our outrage culture, call out culture has really played into that. I personally think body cams and that kind of stuff will end up being what um, what kind of wakes people up because once they start to see more cops in their natural setting and having to deal with the stuff that they do, they'll get mm -hmm. a better understanding of what it's like out there and yeah. understand that, you know, when a cop shoots somebody or when he gets into a violent confrontation, it happens within a second. You know what right. I mean? I mean, it's so quick. The, the difference between a, a, a live cop and a dead cop is like a second, and they have to be tuned into that because it's a dangerous job. It you, is, you know, yeah. you, you pull somebody over, you're dealing with somebody, and they start reaching in their pocket, they're reaching behind their back, they're reaching in between the dash. You don't know what they're going for. So, you, you know, you have to have that mentality as a police officer of, is the situation dangerous? How do I deal with it? Because, you know, you're out there and you're dealing with people that are violent, you're dealing with people that are crazy, and that's in right. every single community. I mean, I'd love the idea that we could live in an America, you know, like the, the 50s, right, where front doors are unlocked, kids are playing on the street, and people trusted each other, seemingly. Yeah, come home oh. and the lights are, uh, you know, off, sweetie. Right, but we, we don't live in that, that age anymore. Um, no. And so, you know, any, any kind of job, you know, even as like a security guard, a cop, uh, you know, anything like that, you're just, you're going to be dealing with people that, either don't like you, want to screw with you, you know, have some reason to try to evade you. Um, but, you know, again, like I said, that's not to say that there aren't incidents where cops do stuff they shouldn't do, or cops are crooked, right. or cops are violent. But if you're going to start some kind of a protest movement to deal with that, then you really need to bring forward good cases that help to prove your point, and not just pick the most recent guy that got shot, or the most recent thing that happened, and act like that justifies your outrage. Because you're only damaging what you're trying to protest about, and I think oh, that's the, that's the always cried wolf. right. And I think that's always been the problem with um, with Black Lives Matters. I, I just they need to pick again better martyrs for their cause. Now, I I've, one of the things that I um, I discovered recently is uh, your video when you were you were talking about the RuneScape community. How did you how did you come across that um, the Reddit post, or or how did you come across the outrage behind? the um like the the gay pride parade or the gay pride event in runescape how did you uh, come across that I, i'm fairly certain somebody messaged me and said something to the effect of you, you should go take a look it's pretty funny um okay. you, you know usually i like to even even if i'm not involved in a community i like to watch things play out uh yeah. it, it's that kind of old uh i guess <laughs> voyeurism i don't know how you describe it but um i i like to be able to kind of watch and see how things play out so they're talking about something going down at RuneScape. I, I went to, or old school RuneScape. I went to go check it out. Um, and just kind of reading through stuff and seeing what people were upset about. And I was like, okay, you know, I, I get it. I get why people are mad. And then looking at the reaction, I think what the really tilted it for me and made me want to do a video on it uh, was the reaction from the, the moderator. Yeah. Uh, in relation Mama to how, or, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, how he was yeah. reacting with the community. And I was like, you know, that he's, he's really coming off dickish. Um, and so I looked into it more and I was like, you know, I'll probably do a video on this because it's pretty interesting. Usually watching stuff like this play itself out in a, a gaming community um, mm -hmm. is interesting. I mean, it reminds me of uh, it reminds me of what used to happen to people on like Bioware forums, where if you <laughs> if, if you criticized a game or something, the mod would instantly come in and scream at you and, and like ban you. Um, right. And so I was like, OK, I, because it was my understanding, and again, I'm not a RuneScape player, so I could be wrong about a lot of things, but it was my understanding old scape, or old school RuneScape started off um, as like, it was at the 2007 version or something, or 2008 yeah. version, and it was originally like a pay-for model, and then it went free later on. But it, from what I understand was, it, it was built on the idea that when they were going to do something, or tinker with something, or do some kind of a event, they would talk with the community, or see what the community's feedback about it was. Exactly. And it seemed like they completely bypassed that. And then when people started getting upset for the various reasons that it upset them, it seemed like the people in charge and the people, you know, mod accounts and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. uh, were mocking them or talking yeah. down to them. and Tr Tried to delegitimize their feelings towards the situation. Right. And, you know, my perspective on that is when you have an older game with a dedicated fan base that's hung on as long as the people in RuneScape have, 
Yeah. Um, you probably as a company don't want to piss them off because it's not like you're going to get a lot of new blood. I don't hear a lot of 13 and 14 year olds walking around saying, hey, let's go play old school RuneScape. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? So I, it just seemed really counterintuitive how they handled the situation. And, and that's not the first time that that's happened. I mean, you have the, the whole reason that the game came out was because nobody and I say nobody because that's, that's it's an overgeneralization at this point because there's not a whole lot of people to defend it. But there are a lot of people if you just go on like Facebook and go on RuneScape meme pages, there's a lot of people that man like, man, I can't I quit in 2012 after they introduced the evolution of combat, which was like this really clunky version of what general MMOs are. You know, it's had buttons like that you can press for abilities like uh, in World of Warcraft 1 through 9 and you can key bind and stuff like that. But the problem is like the game is, you, you know how RuneScape plays. You know, it's click to move. It's on a grid based system. And no matter how tiny you make those grid squares, unless you have a free movement, like it's, it's kind of hard to have a combat system that you click and wait, you know, adding abilities to that you're just hype they hyper inflated the numbers added abilities and that was pretty much it but there's no targeting system you know there's no um there's no like uh mechanical incentive to be to be playing runescape with you know abilities because when you click a, an ability that maybe has like a target it will literally walk your character to the target so like if something has an unavoidable or an avoidable um, mechanic, you literally will just walk right into it if you accidentally hit a button, which is kind of stupid. It, it's I, I want to say it's like artificial difficulty. That is not really difficult. It's just kind of like there, and if you fuck up accidentally, then you're punished for it in a way that like if you were playing a classical MMO, it wouldn't have happened because you could have just moved right out of it or paid more attention. But the whole reason that Old School RuneScape came about was because people didn't like the evolution of combat. They didn't like how the game was being... Um, uh, developed at that point because there was a lot of microtransactions that um, there's this one guy on uh, YouTube who makes videos he he literally maxed out his RuneScape account with real money and it took him like 20 something thousand dollars but it was things like that that led to old school RuneScape being created it was people really liked the older version of RuneScape how it was being played um, back then and they wanted it to be their game they wanted the developers to develop a game around community-based voting um to make it better for i mean the long term it wasn't just some short-term like private server you log on to they wanted it to have real meaning to them because it's what people liked and soon 2007 runescape essentially um started clocking over the the numbers of runescape 3 to the point to where I'm pretty sure that uh, on RuneScape 2007's best day, you, there's I think you know over two or three thousand more active players um, than on the main game that Jagex puts their money into, which is RuneScape 3. And that was that was a big uh, incentive to play RuneScape old, uh, old school was that you could vote on everything. You could say, okay, well. Um, if we add this boss, should we give it X? And then there's, you know, yes, no, or pass. And that's where I think that a lot of people were upset is that, like, uh, even with the smallest things, like Halloween events, there was a pull for it of some kind. Um, but they took this, like, uh, almost cop-out straw poll during a RuneScape stream and were like, well... Oh, the the community agrees with us, so that must mean that we can do it now. <laughs> so it does. It does. Didn't make any sense. Yeah, it, I, I can understand what you're talking about. So the, the implementation of a, a newer mechanic in an older game didn't go over so well, and that kind of drove people over to an to older, just older stop version. Stop playing. Yeah, an yeah, older just version stop playing. Um, it, it's weird. It's like developers have this. Uh, so they set up like an offshoot, and people start using that. And once they see the numbers increase, they suddenly want to get more hands on. Not realizing people went to the offshoot, the older version, because they liked that it was hands off, that they weren't tinkering right. with it. Um, yeah, and so th that was part of what played into it was the idea that the community usually gave feedback, um, was usually you know brought into the conversation about things, and this was just kind of thrown on them. Um, yeah. So it was yeah, it was an interesting story altogether. Uh, just kind of watching it play out and watching the reaction to it, uh, because I can imagine. Uh, you know how crappy that can be when you're a part of a gaming community or you're really tied into a game and just watching it be tinkered with to the point where it just isn't what it used to be and having to find something new especially when you've been committed for years and years and years to it and that's kind of what happened to world of warcraft world of warcraft they um 
I don't know. I want to say I want to say that they they stopped really caring. I don't want to say that they stopped caring, but a lot of the people that that actually gave a shit about the game left because they didn't like the way that the company was taking their game. And and then a lot of players in, you know, in turn left as well because it was like the more and more you you're playing and engaging with this game, it's starting to not become the game that it was. Like it, or it's starting to kind of morph into something completely different and it makes it not fun anymore because you're changing so many things that make it great. You know, why am I going to continue to play something that you guys are just running into the ground? You know, just like, why would I, why would I uh, keep using Xfinity if Xfinity is uh, pay- charging me 150 bucks for just garbage service? You know, why am I going to continue to eat at this restaurant if the, you know, it's notoriously shitty. So, I, I think that's just a lot of developers have lost my lost my trust over the years because of that because it seems that um, the more they go into certain things the less they care about others like the more they go into microtransactions the less they care about actual gameplay. Well, and it seems too like I, I think JX is in a position right now that's probably not good. I mean, they were sold to one Chinese company and then that mm-hmm. Chinese company sold it to another Chinese company, so they probably don't know what to do with the uh, the assets and the properties. Uh, and so really you only have the community to guide it, you know, to try to at least get their message out and be like, hey, this is why we like this. This is why we are involved with it. Uh, and so if you've got people at that middle level between the you know, upper company and the player base, you know, as moderators or people running, running different things mm-hmm. and they're and they're not really taking any feedback, it's just going to destroy it and drive people away. And again, with something that old, you can't really afford to drive away your older player base because you're not going to have new players come in to fill that that uh, gap. Right. And there's there's like three or four different types of people that play, you know, RuneScape. There's the people that play for the nostalgia, the people that are uh, new, um, that enjoy it, you know, that they, they fall under that nostalgia category. But then there's a, another group of people that literally will play, that play the game for money, like because... It's currency, RuneScape currency, World of Warcraft currency. Apparently, every currency in any sort of fantasy video game is worth more than Venezuelan gold or Venezuelan uh, the dollars. I mean, RuneScape gold is worth like a dollar is fourteen a mil, and people people pay a lot of money for it. There's there was this recent controversy where um, this RuneScape streamer um, who does like a, a version of like fifty fifty staking. It's, it's literally just gambling, but it's fifty fifty. Um, he sold about twenty thousand dollars of uh of RuneScape gold, and you you say that twenty thousand dollars what what the, what the fuck? But that's not he's not an anomaly. There's several I would say groups of people who have that kind of money you know being trafficked monthly, weekly, just depending on uh, how dedicated they are to it. And then you have like the the people that play competitively. They play for experience gains and shit like that, but the more and more that they start catering to one or the other, like they, they either cater to the new people or they cater to the old people. It's, it's kind of like, uh, for, for a really long time, what I've gotten is that they don't really give a shit about the person behind the computer screen. They just care about how, how are they going to continue to get the subscription, um, in the most general way possible. Right. Right. So. Uh, you know, and, and as far as like, like I said, I don't play RuneScape. I think the only, the closest I've come to the company would be, you know, cause they published, they had yeah. a hand in, uh, Ace of Spades <laughs> and just kind of watching that. Uh, and they did something similar. I mean, the, the DLC that was released fractured the player base. So you had a, a low mm-hmm. amount of people playing and then you put an entry barrier, uh, to continue playing with them, which was the DLC. Cause it wasn't mixed multiplayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was like segregated. So you, if you had the DLC, you were separate from the, the normal numbers. Uh, and you can see that really hurt uh, the amount of people that was playing. And it went from maybe a, a couple thousand to, if you try to play Ace of Spades now on like Steam, 40 or 50 people, if you're lucky, right. will be on during the entire day. That's kind of sad too, because Ace of Spades, like when it first came out, I mean, perfect example of graphics don't make the game. Like it was a fun game that you could sit there and, and waste, you know, I, I mean, I say this and, and it would be like, oh, that's how do you waste that much time in a single sitting? I, I'm six, seven hours just sitting there, you know, shooting people with little squares. It, it was it was right. a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a good game. It, it was it was a pretty good game. Um, and I know they changed it from the original free version. But mm-hmm. e- even with that, um, they still had like the classic mode and stuff. So it, it was fun. And then the DLC came. It broke the community. 
Uh, they tried to repair that by making the DLC somewhat free. And then later on, they released DLC characters, and it, it's just the same shit over and over again. But if you've got 40 mm -hmm. or 50 people playing and you keep fracturing it, it, it's done at that point. They'll never get the numbers back. The game is dead. Um, well, they're notorious for making for doing that shit. They're, they're yeah. notorious for, for splitting communities and, and running games into the ground. They don't have a game right now that's so successful that they've not fucked you know, the, the one community or another in that specific part of the game. Uh, and, and I think game. I think that mentality goes back to them not looking at realistic numbers. I mean, they're not looking at the amount of people playing; they're mm -hmm. looking at the amount of units shipped or sold. So they look right. at like Ace of Spades and they think, "Oh shit, we've sold 150,000 copies. Uh, we should do DLC because we'll we'll at least get 10 percent of that." Thinking we'll get 15,000 purchases, but the reality is you've got 2,000 people playing it. So it's right. not 150,000 people that'll buy your DLC. It's 2,000, and of that, maybe 10 percent. So you're looking at maybe selling 200 copies of something, and then that has a, a negative effect on the people playing because it, it fractures that small number. Um, right. it, it's just bad business, really, is what it is from their perspective. You know, from my perspective, looking at what they're doing, it's bad business. I can't imagine that it was a very profitable move, and um, you know that's probably probably part of the reason why they got uh, the deal with the Chinese company in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a long time coming. There's actually rumors back in. Uh, 2013 about it but um s s some point i think that was right around the time that old school runescape came out that they made their money so they didn't have to they were they kind of they kind of dipped a little bit you know in altitude and they're like okay now we're stabilizing a little bit but now i think it got to the point where the the numbers dropped so low that they had to they had to do something because uh, as a company they c they couldn't have been making that much money off of their their uh, their already free to play game um uh, but there is a lot of incentive to 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 actually buy membership because old school RuneScape. I mean, if you've if you're not not even a veteran, but even if you enjoy the game in any way, it's it's a lot of fun once you start getting into it because it's it's instant gratification. It's like the mouse and meth. You know, the mouse p presses the button, gets some meth. Like it's it's like that. You get you 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 sit there for ten minutes, you get a wood cutting level. Oh my god, that's cool! I got a little pop up that says congratulations. I got thirty seven wood cutting, and you go on and you do something else, and you get a little notification. You keep trying to hit that button. And some people, they get sucked into it and they love it. Um, and so I, I can see why Old School RuneScape does it, but um, there's just, a, as a company, that's, that's not their bread and butter anymore. They need, to, they need to focus on a lot of other things. But um, one of the things that I was, uh, I was looking at recently is the, the drama in other gaming communities. Like, have you been keeping up with, um, have you been keeping up with like all the stuff that's going on um, with like uh, esports and stuff like that? Like uh, League of Legends communities, like they do, um, they travel quite a bit to different countries. And there was a, a, an article recently published that like uh, companies, like uh, hotel companies, were going to stop hosting these YouTubers and uh, these streamers because of how much damage they cause to these uh, these these hotels and these establishments. You see anything like that? Uh, well, no, no. I could imagine YouTubers being a pain in the ass once they start to get um, uh, a big enough following. Uh, yeah. Like, as far as esports, I used to watch like uh, Brood Wars back in the day, but I mean that was always like mm -hmm. Koreans playing. Yeah. Um, and so you had to wait for a translation to come through, or you had to get English commentators to really kind of follow along. And, and watching mm -hmm. that was pretty fun because it was really new at the time uh, and entertaining. But aside from that, I really don't keep up with esports. Um, I, I know right. some of the scandals that have gone on with the fake gambling sites, you know, stuff oh, like yeah, that, yeah. CSGO. Uh, CSGO. Yep. Uh, and, and I know a few, uh, you know, scandals about cheating. Uh, there, yeah. was, there was one guy at a Smash tournament that made a joke, and everybody was like, it's so racist, he needs to be uh, thrown out. Right. Uh, you know, stuff like that. But outside of one or two events, I really haven't kept my, uh, my ear to the grindstone as far as, like, esports goes, because it's not really something that I... I follow too religiously. The, the only reason I mentioned that is I, I got a little notification on my phone that, that was like this Reddit post about some guy that I was a shifter, some some League of Legends dude. I, I don't know what he did, but I was like, you know, that's there's a lot of different drama. Like RuneScape's got a shitload of drama. I mean, I could I could talk about that shit for hours. There's the girl that faked cancer for for money. There's uh, fucking people real world trading. You know, was owning their own gold sites, their own gambling sites. I think the, the biggest the biggest problem with a lot of drama, um, especially like RuneScape drama, is that people, do, they don't own up to shit. They, after they're caught, they continue to kind of just be snakes in the grass. They're like, oh, no, you know, I, I, I did it for this reason, and uh, we're still cool, right, guys? <laughs> it's like, no, you, you fucked up. Just say you fucked up. 
And a lot of people like it, especially drama related stuff, will just inflate the situation real bad. And it'll just get worse to where they get fucking picked off the face of the map. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty typical behavior all around. I mean, when somebody gets busted for doing something like a scam or whatever. Yeah. uh, Usually they start to associate themselves uh, with the scam. So like when you're attacking what they did, they take it as an insult against them Mm -hmm. rather than just saying, you know what? Yeah, I fucked up and I shouldn't have done that. They're like, oh, why are you attacking me? So it becomes this big fucking thing where they just can't come out and say, yeah, I I fucked up. I shouldn't have done it. Um, Yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff like that in gaming. I mean, there there have been a lot of scams. You remember the Twitch streamer who uh, pretended to be paralyzed? He was in a wheelchair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just got up. Yeah, got up and walked out of the room. And, and so, like, <laughs> what the fuck was that? Because this guy was making a ton of cash, had a bunch of followers, and it was all bullshit. Right. Um, yeah, a, a lot of stuff like that pops up. A lot of, I need money, I'm in a bad situation, I've got cancer, I'm injured, I'm ill, I'm doing a fundraiser. Uh, co- you know, come to my gambling site, it's legitimate. Uh, come come to my gold trading site or item site, and then you end up getting FIs and all your information's out there and they're using it. Uh, it, it just a lot of crazy shit like that happens in every community. So I, it's interesting to watch from the outside when you're not a part of it. Uh, it's got to be infuriating when you're in the community and watching it kind of implode over your head as you know everybody's getting sucked up into it. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm, I'm friends with a few different YouTubers, and one of the things that I've noticed, um, not with all of them, but with some of them is that um, they, they'll, they'll often, oftentimes they'll pretend to care about a subject just, just for the simple fact that it's trending. It's making, it, it'll make them a little bit of cash. How, how do you decide what to make a video on? You're talking about like, like a life in a tent just, scen- just scenario yeah, where they're, yeah, yeah. kind of <laughs> exactly like, I, you know, obviously you said that you, you, what threw you over the edge was the Monomat case response. So like when you're seeing, when you're seeing something, when when is the creative uh, snap? When do you say, okay, I, I'm making a video on this. I'm going to start working on that. I, I guess humor or anger. Uh, usually if I find it funny, like the Deviant stuff, which is yeah. just laughing at really ridiculous shit, or uh, I find it interesting, like uh, Internet and Sandy, where you're watching like this almost soap opera, like a, a telenovela play itself out. And you're like, holy <laughs> shit, I've got I got to do a video on that. Or when it makes me genuinely angry to a point, uh, which would be like... Um, Howard Schneider, which was the dentist that was torturing kids without using anesthetic and yeah. pulling out their teeth. You know, he, he'd get an eight-year-old, strap them to a chair, and then not use any Novocaine or gas and rip out half their teeth. Oh, um, shit. Yeah, it was some brutal shit. And, you know, he I did a video on that. I got a lot of pushback from people on that <laughs> at the time saying, oh, what proof do you have that that happened? Well, he, not only has he had 100 civil li- or lawsuits filed against him, he lost his license. He is... Uh, arraigned on like eight or nine different charges for medicare fraud uh you know for for injuring minors and he he got a um, psychological evaluation saying that he was unstable and not able to go to court (laughs) so basically they're saying this guy was crazy and he was operating on kids so like and there's a video of it there's a video of a four-year-old strapped to a a chair screaming as he's drilling out his teeth and you know watching that pissed me off so i did a video on that that video (laughs) uh one of the one of the uh, dental assistants was like they they said something was they were like something's wrong here you know like what's what's going on in this office is wrong and so they filmed it and released the tape and that that all of a sudden all these parents start talking to their kids and all the kids oh, say the same thing they're like yeah he never he never gave me novocaine he never uh, did this or that uh and so yeah just like an evil asshole doing it for money you know saving a buck saying he used anesthesia yeah. when he didn't um Oh, St- so stuff like that. So it's either funny, it's interesting in a, a kind of a morbid curiosity sort of way, or it genuinely makes me upset. I don't like to just do a video because it's something being talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the time you won't see me talk about stuff. Like uh, Sargon at whatever that VidCon panel was with Anita Sarkeesian. Right. I had no interest in talking about that. I know everybody else did a video on it. There were, there were 10,000 videos talking about it. I had zero interest right. in talking about it. That's well, um, not new. Well, it's not that it's just not new, but it's not something that caught my attention. You well, know, I mean, it, like the the type of the type of shit Anita Sarkeesian you know, stirs. You, uh, well, yeah, that 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 too. But I mean, again, it just goes back to unless it's interesting, funny, or really pisses me off, I'm not going to talk about it. it. Yeah, and, and I don't care if there are people doing videos and those videos are getting millions of views because they're talking about it. If it just mm-hmm. doesn't have a connection, I have no interest in pursuing it. Who, who do you watch on YouTube? I mean. I watch, uh, well, yeah, I don't watch. People get the idea that because I talk about uh, social justice stuff or I talk about politics on occasion uh, that I'm, like, really tuned into it, and that's what I watch. 
I will, you know what? I'll pull it up right now. You want to know what I watch? I'll tell you uh, some of the stuff I'm subscribed to to give you an idea of what I actually have. Firefox, hold on. After the newest update, for whatever reason, my browser is just dragging its ass across the internet trying to start it up. I think some of my plugins are are, uh, wonking it out on me here, but uh, one moment. I've been using Chrome for the longest time now because every time I use Firefox, like Firefox for the longest time had this problem where it would just keep crashing. It would constantly keep crashing on me and... It pissed me off to the point where I was like, okay, I'll use Chrome. And I started using Chrome, and that didn't do me any good because it's just – I don't know I don't know what I don't like about Chrome, but every time I get on, I just have this little aneurysm in the back of my head, and I'm so, going to die soon because of it. Yeah, so th- this is the kind of stuff I watch. I, l- I watch a podcast called Old School Wrestling. Mm-hmm. Uh, really great shit, really, really funny stuff if you're into, like, the really old wrestling stuff. They're, they're great guys, funny to listen to. Uh, I watch Twin Perfect, the guys that did the Silent Hill uh, review videos, and they do like gaming okay. stuff. Uh, Cross Counter TV with like Gutex and stuff, I like that. Um, so a lot of gaming stuff. Uh, I watch like Your Movie Sucks. Uh, I'm just going through the list here. Uh, like comic review stuff, like Comic Island, uh, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. And then like Viola Attack is like a YouTube channel from like 2007 that has an archive of almost every. Uh, you know, Brood Wars Korean match with English commentary on it, which is really great to go back to and kind of, kind of watch. Um, so it, it it's gaming, it's um, comic books and movie reviews. That that's what I watch. It sounds like a lot of spare time. YouTube. It's like I go on it. I go and watch these guys when I got a little bit of time. I got to kill. Yeah, yeah, or you know something like Digital Foundry, where they're talking about like a a game the frame rate it has, any issues it has. I'll watch their mm-hmm. stuff too. Now, like uh, as far as news sources, like there you're obviously kind of more in tune with the world than some people obviously you kind of have to be to to talk to talk uh i would i want to say confidently in issues uh, and especially in like videos that you've made so like who do you who do you go to for news like i mean i i'll say it right now like i don't pay attention to the news because i don't have i don't i mean i got my phone but i just do other things and i i watch philip defranco And I'll listen to the shit he says for like 10 minutes and that's it. And if there's nothing, if there's something missing in that, then I'm going to be the shocked guy that be like, oh, did you hear that uh, six people were raped by Muslim immigrants in Philadelphia? I'll be like, what? What? No way. When did that happen? Like six days ago? Oh, oh, wow. Um, Well, yeah, as far as news goes, I don't really trust anybody. Uh, So generally what I'll do is if like something pops up, I'll go read the article written about it on at least like five or six different sites. So, like, uh, I'll pick, like, two or three left-leaning ones, two or three right-leaning ones, and then usually what I find is information that lines up between those is, it, it is, is like, the root of what might be going on. When you, when you can, uh, yeah, like, you use them to counterbalance each other and er- eliminate the bias, and you have a little chunk left over that gives you an idea of what to, like, look what into. really went on. Yeah, what to look into, and then I use that information and I look into it as best I can uh, to kind of see, I, I guess, what happened. Um, but I mean, everybody, like every news site you go to is going to have a bias one way or the other. You can't, you can't really expect to get anything straight up. There's no real news wire service anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the onus is on the user to go find that information on their own. Now, if it's like an online community thing where it's not like national news, uh, usually I try to look into it myself. I'll, I'll I'll see somebody talk about it in a thread maybe on like, uh, like V or poll or something, or just some kind of a forum I might frequent. Um, and then I'll, I'll like use that as a starting point to try to find out what's going on. But you, yeah, you can't expect to have anybody give you anything that's remotely true anymore. Uh, everybody's full of shit at this point, and you've got to get good at digging through it to try to find some nugget of truth. I mean, that's just, that's the internet for the past however long. It, I mean, what, I would say since like 2008, the internet's just been a steaming pile of shit. Um, and you just got to start <laughs> weeding through all the shit just to find the things you're trying to look for, or the information you're trying to look for. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Do you, like uh, what? When, when was the last big growth subscriber wise that you had? Like, do you do you remember at what point you started seeing a, a substantial growth? Uh, uh, well, I mean, I guess that would be what channel are we talking about? Oh, what cha- How many channels do you have? Uh, I've had maybe seventy. Holy fuck! You have to understand my mentality when using the internet is kind of an older one, mm-hmm. where you would use a username, uh, just for whatever community you were in. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'd make a YouTube account related to a username on whatever form or community I was a part of. And then right. the videos that were up on that were always usually related to that specific group. 
I didn't I didn't really start doing YouTube videos under like a unified name until maybe seven years ago, maybe oh, wow. seven or six years ago. Uh, the Medica account that I'm on right now is only about two years old. Right. Um, I think currently it's sitting at like 160,000 subs. Uh, the last big growth started back in February, and that would be when I started producing consistently. Um, usually it was just I'd, I'd put up four or five videos, and then I'd, I wouldn't do anything for three months. <laughs> um, but when I started, I yeah, when I started putting out videos consistently, uh, and people could rely on that on a you know a regular basis, I, I started seeing the numbers kind of kind of rise. And I, I think that would be the same with anybody. If you're going to do something and you do it well, or you do it consistently, or you mm -hmm. do it both of those well and consistently, you're going to see an increase in traffic to whatever it is you're talking about. Right. Um, I, I can't like pinpoint it on a specific moment and be like, okay, it was. It was this video. I mean, I talked about Shia LaBeouf, bef you know, right when it was starting, because that had my interest. Was right. watching him do this art uh, art protest bullshit, um, <laughs> and that video got. <clears throat> sorry, got a just getting over a little bit of allergies here, uh, and that had about like maybe half a million views in, in yeah. a couple of days. Um, but it, you know, the most popular one I put up was the Tumblrisms, which is on the account, which is like a million, one point uh, one million, and that just was a slow continual growth. Uh, I'm not really like a huge metrics guy. I know some YouTubers are really into that shit, and they'll right. like they'll track the numbers daily and they'll uh, try to find out what the trending topic is and how to get the users engaged. That again, that does it goes counter to what I'm into, which is, is it interesting to me? Is it something I find funny or is unique? it worth spending my time on? Right, basically, yeah. I was because uh, I've seen I've seen a good portion of the videos on your channel and. Um, we talked earlier, and, I, and you, you mentioned that you were, you know, you've done some streams, you've been playing games. I, I, I wonder if, you know, you are ever going to take what audience you have and uh, attempt to uh, not even transfer a community, but start something with that community. You know, like uh, maybe a website that has things that you find interesting. Because there's, I feel like with the videos that you make, there's a market for people who really want to engage with the things that you find interesting. Um, and, and it just shows with, you know, the first day of you putting out a video, you're, you're sitting at 100,000 views. So you're out of 160,100, you know, and or 905 subscribers, you have uh, a fairly decent portion of active people who you know, engage and participate in what you put out. So I'm wondering if, like, if that's something that does that, does that interest you? Like putting um, uh, your. I, I will give you the truth. Uh, if you want to know about running a community, it's always a nightmare. You can ask. Oh, you, no, you can ask anybody that's ever gone in to try to make a website, whether that's something like 4chan with Moot, whether that's something awful with Lotax, uh, mm. Richard Bauman with Ebombs World. It doesn't really matter what the community is. It will eventually lead to the creator going insane or being depressed or wanting to get the hell out of Dodge. Like, it right. just never turns out well. And, you know, I, the last thing I want is to be driven insane uh, trying to manage some kind of a, a community or a website. It's it's not something I'd be interested in. You know, I, I don't really have an interest in trying to say, hey, guys, come over to uh, to my website or hey, hey guys, come over to my forum. Um, because, you know... Right now is the way things are. It, it works out semi okay, um, but it, there's some stuff coming down the pipeline as far as running your own website that I think are going to be issues for people. Uh, Cloudflare, uh, usually which is a very neutral company, uh, right. recently dropped its protection services for the Daily Stormer. Uh, oh, wow. You know, and, and even though the Daily Stormer is what it is, it, it was very weird to see Cloudflare do that. A Digital Ocean, which is you know is kind of like a GoDaddy dropped in mm -hmm. services for Hatreon. So I you know I think what we're going to start to see is websites that uh, have uh, not very PC communities are going to start to be under the gun a lot. And right. uh, you know if you say stuff that is even if it's meant to be humorous but is extreme in some extent, uh, those sites aren't going to have uh, people hosting them. They're not going to have services, they're not going to have uh, DDoS protection. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's just you, you go out, you set it up and then it falls apart in a year. And it just, it seems like a lot of effort to put into something that's either going to drive me crazy or be destroyed by the people that are supposed to be providing the services I'm paying for. Right. Uh, dig digital uh, assured destruction. Yeah, that that's what the video yeah. was talking about. It, it's the only way that I saw, at least at the time, to, I, I guess, try to deal with what I saw as a, kind of a, a censorship push. 
on the part of social media platforms and service providers. It's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. I mean, it's not like as bad as other countries, but you, you know, we're, we're in a society now where um, if you don't like what I, if, if I don't like what you say and I have more money than you, or if I've got control over something you don't, that I can, I can yank the rug out from your feet and say, you can't say that on this platform or any platform that I can control. Um, and that, and that kind of sucks. I feel like there's, uh, <sighs> there's an issue stirring in, in the, the online communities um, with not speaking out against it or not saying enough um, to kind of raise awareness. Um, there needs to be more videos like Dad. There needs to be a lot more videos from people who have bigger audiences saying this this is going to happen to us if we don't say, hey, don't fucking throttle my internet. Hey, don't tell me what I can and can't consume or can and can't consume. Rather. Right. It's um, it's a shift from, you know, the Internet used to be if you didn't like it, don't go to it or you, right. you can choose for yourself what you consume. But now a lot of these companies want to put themselves in the position of choosing for you and right. taking the, you know, the base position that you are unable to do it or that you're mm -hmm. highly offended at everything. And I think that that's going to be an issue going forward for a lot of people on major social media and even, you know, service providers is how do you deal with that? And then that's, you know, encouraged or facilitated. By companies like Twitter, which is run by Jack Dorsey, who mm -hmm. allows on his platform certain individuals that can do actions that other people could never do. So you've right. got uh, accounts like Yes, You're Racist, which is run by a Huffington Post writer and editor, uh, Logan Smith, who's doxing people. And then the docs that he comes up with in the story, this is what I find really interesting about this situation. He works for Huffington Post. Huffington, <clears throat> excuse me, Huffington Post is writing about what he's doing, but not explaining that he works for them. So it almost seems like Huffington Post is using somebody who's on staff to stir up drama to create a story to write about. So he goes out, he doxes somebody, it gets 10,000 retweets, they write a story about it. He goes out, he doxes somebody, it gets 20,000 retweets, they write another story about it. It's very bizarre stuff that's going on, but if that happened in any other circumstance, if that was a Breitbart writer, and that, the, yeah, and that news site was Breitbart, Jack Dorsey would drop the hammer on them so fast uh, they would be they would be off platform. It'd be like what happened with Yiannopoulos, where he was you know fighting with uh, whoever the Ghostbuster actress was, uh, <laughs> and, and he's off site in an instant with no no a chance to really appeal that. Um, and hell, I mean, Logan Smith, th this uh, I think it's Logan Smith, th this writer from Huffington Post, even had a Patreon, mm -hmm. so he he was making thirty five hundred four thousand dollars a month doxing people on Twitter. And, you know, that's that's a huge violation of Patreon's terms of services. You can't dox people, especially you can't make your site or, or your service about doxing people. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, luckily, I will give Jack Conte credit. He did pull that down. Uh, you know, he did that video about Lauren Southern and then um, it's going down and saying, hey, we're, we're trying to create a system with manifest observable behavior. Uh, we're trying to do it where if we see real harm being done, we're going to pull the thing down. And true to his word, at least after that video came out, he did take... Uh, yes, you're racist, Patreon down, saying that it really did violate uh, what they were trying to do. But it, it, it's crazy stuff. There, there's some weird shit going on. And I guess back to your original question, yeah, I wouldn't want to, uh, I wouldn't want to run a website right now. You know, uh, maybe not even a website, because like, I, I know you do this stuff for fun. You don't make money off of your, um, your YouTube videos, aside from what you maybe get from your Patreon, which is, which is great. Um, I, I think that um, I, if this was another time, I would say that you'd, you're hurting yourself um, because it, it, it came to a lot of our attentions um, that YouTube would actually not recommend your videos um, as often or as uh, in, in a large amount if you didn't have your videos monetized. So um, one of the things that I realized um, is that YouTube doesn't really give a shit about, you know, and, and this is not a, this isn't a new realization, but it was like, it was at the time where all of my videos and, and I mean, if you take some time to watch some of my, my older videos, they're all garbage. Like all my videos are garbage. I, I, know, I came to that realization like a long time ago because I, I noticed that I, I wing things way too much. I, I don't actually put a lot of effort into it. I just kind of do it. And then if it sticks, it sticks. And I want to stop doing that because I, I enjoy, you know, making things that people like watching. But 
they the the videos that were at three four hundred views, I I monetized it, and within a month, every single video, uh, I would say quadrupled in views, and I have the metrics too. And it was just it's so sad to see that like if I want to be a little bit humble and to say, hey, I don't want to make money off the things that I make, I just want to do it for fun. That YouTube will literally like push you down and say, ah, oh, well. You're not making us money, so uh, we're gonna give priority to some guy that's like shit posting pictures of his dog's progression of, of out of 365 days, or you know, uh, epic, late epic Vine compilations. You know, uh, well, I mean, it sucks. Th th there's a game to be played on YouTube. I mean, it depends on what the mentality you're going into it with. And yes, it's changed a little bit with their their limited state and everything else. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you've got two choices. You can either do the videos that you like to do. And uh, if people like it, they will find it eventually. Right. Or you can play the money game and do the videos which are popular. And, uh, you know, the videos which are popular and blowing up right now would be compilation videos and uh, list videos, which yeah. are relatively very safe and really easy to make. Right. And they're, they're white noise, so people consume a lot of them. They'll, they'll have one and then they'll watch it and click another one, not even really thinking because they're not paying attention to it. So with videos like that, I mean, you can make a, a shit ton of cash. You can grow your sub base. I've seen list video and compilation channels go from a thousand subscribers to 200,000 in the span of two or three months. So if, yeah. you're, if you're looking for money, if you really want to make it big, that's what you do. I, I'll tell you that right, you know, outright. I've said that for a year or like a year now. Um, that's the way to get big on YouTube at the moment and make some money uh, aside from like vlogging, which is like right. another big trend right now. But I mean, it, it cycles of the internet. It's the things that are kind of popular or not popular uh you know early in youtube you had a lot of really kind of basic stuff and then it moved into like i'd say almost uh, uh atheist versus versus like creationist stuff was really popular for a while yeah and then it moved in yeah, yeah and then it moved into uh like let's plays mm -hmm. and then it moved into retsu praise and then it moved <laughs> into you know it's like <laughs> you've got like three or four years to find yeah. a trend and to exploit the trend so you got about another three years if you really want to make money and get big on youtube my recommendation would be uh, set aside any interest you have in the video and just do list and compilation videos. Pick, it doesn't even matter what it's quite about. Literally. Yeah, quite literally. You could do 10 Deadliest Sharks or some dumb shit like that. And you top five dogs that got blown away by LAPD. Right, and you will have a half a million views on that thing within weeks. Because, uh, so, one of my, uh, my friend Kevin and I were talking about, like, videos that we could make that everybody can consume, and it's like, um, it's, it's literally just about titles and phrasing. Like I could literally make a video. Um, and I, I was as a joke, cause he was asking me if it was, if it was worth getting a PS4. And I said, is the PS4 worth getting? Check out my newest video. And I, we, I thought about it for a second. I'm like, that's an every man's video. Like I can make a video of three to five minutes long that, you know, the, is the PS4 worth playing? Well, with a lot of exclusives and the updated graphics, I would blah, 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 blah. And just fucking write a, a script and show some exclusives like the last of us and uh i think what uh the order 1886 i don't know if that's exclusive but it's one of those games that people enjoy the hell out of it's just like it's an every man's video and that's what list videos are and um there's this one guy named fab he literally just takes memes and puts them in 11 minutes uh, sequences and i i'm not even kidding his uh i, I joined his discord a week ago and he's gained 13,000 subscribers and it's literally just fucking like your average Facebook memes compiled into 11 minute videos. Uh, the, the other thing I'd say is occasionally people will capture like lightning in a bottle with a presentation or an idea. Uh, mm -hmm. One I came across recently was a guy named Chubby Emu or Emu? Chubby mm -hmm. Emu I think is how you pronounce it. He had like maybe 20,000 subs. His videos were about health stuff. You know, yeah. eating right, keeping healthy, that kind of shit. Really basic stuff. He did a video a week ago that has like 2.3 million views already, and people are going fucking batshit for it. Right. Um, it's like, imagine, like, have you ever seen the show House? Yeah. Okay, so, like, imagine House mixed with, like, um, Rescue 911 or Unsolved Mysteries. Oh, okay. And he's basically presenting a medical case and going over the details and kind of following it. It's a mom who drank three gallons of water in two hours. This is what happened. And, like, that's exploding. And he asked in the comments, do you guys want, like, a Medical Monday kind of mystery thing? And he got a shit ton of responses. People were going crazy for it. Like, yes, do this. And I guarantee you, if that guy makes those videos consistently, he will be at probably millions of subs within a year. So, like, if you, if you occasionally will stumble across something that can really work, this guy probably has gold. 
and if he follows up on it, will be a very huge YouTube channel. Um, I don't know if he will pursue it or not, but you know, outside of something like that, yeah, list and compilation videos are the way to go, or being a vlogger and a Vine compilation kind of stuff are pretty popular right now. I, I mean, I understand, uh, I understand most trends, and it's just like the drama trend where you had Keemstar and people just digging into each other's past. That, that shit was like, that, that was vicious, like... But yeah, but I mean, Ke- Keemstar has really carved out a, uh, a niche for himself. I mean, he is YouTube drama news. He's like TMZ for YouTube, basically. What um, is up? Like, he just, <laughs> yeah. he's got his own little label, man. But I mean, that's what he's known for. So I, it, it's weird. People were doing that for the longest time. But now when you talk about YouTube drama, people are like, oh, Keemstar. Like, he, exactly. he was able to associate his name with that idea. Um, and so he he's probably going to be, I mean, he's shit millions of subs already he'll probably be mm-hmm. five to ten million by the end of it i i, I you know the thing is like people stopped caring if their youtube drama kind of dropped off like the end of last year like once once leafy and once all the stuff like i once i dubs made and i i don't like following i don't like i, I don't like subscribing to this idea but it, it's every time i dubs has made a content comp that person has been significantly like very significantly less important on the the site like Leafy, the way that Leafy responded killed his channel. I, I would say that that is... Well, I, I, I think iDubbbz did. I mean, the the way... I, I liked the video. I, I know what you're talking about, the one where he took him down and made fun of his chin. I, yeah. I, I, that, was, yeah. that was funny as shit. I mean, let's be honest. It was funny how he presented it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if Leafy had a better response, maybe he would have done okay. But, again, there's a very... Like, the weird thing about YouTube right now, at least specifically with YouTube, is the gap keeps shortening. So, like, if you started a channel right when YouTube was young, like 2006, right? Mm -hmm. It would have taken you forever from 2006 to maybe, like, five or six years to get to 100,000 subs. But then if you started it in 2010, it would have taken you two or three years. And, you know, if you started it in 2014, it would have taken a year. Well, now you can do it in months. Like, your shelf life on YouTube is getting uh, shorter and shorter and shorter as the user base increases in numbers. Because right. the next new thing is right around the corner, and you're not going to be able to compete because it will do it in, uh, in a new, innovative way, or it'll do it uh, better than you do it. Uh, so Leafy, you know, he's still very big. He still has a big, large channel, and he still gets a lot of views. But mm-hmm. compared to when he was at his peak, it's nothing, and it's yeah, just going to absolutely. continue to decline. I mean, it was it was there and it was gone, and a lot of channels are like that. They're really big, and then they just completely disappear. I mean. I, I, I wouldn't say that the uh, the main reason for that is that uh, between Leafy and and why Scarce was never more popular than Keemstar is because Scarce and Leafy they're they're like the Olive Garden of YouTubers. They there's just one big word salad getting tossed around for ten minutes. You know, Scarce would say some shit like, "Hey, what's up, guys? It's Scarce here. Got a couple new topics to talk about today. Some <laughs> crazy stuff's been happening recently. Apparently, this guy actually died. N- super crazy. A guy, I guess he died. Like he stopped breathing." And then uh, he just died. Uh, so he would just like he would keep he keep repeating the same thing in different ways. And then Leafy would just like this guy literally looks like a fucking raccoon eating a flaming pile of shit. Like he he is literally a retard. Like <laughs> he would just he just saying nothing for ten minutes. And that's why eventually like both of them they just kind of dipped off. You know, Keemstar kind of just I I don't know I I don't really like Keemstar that much. I am very neutral to feeling towards him now, but it's like. He says, hey, this is what happened. This is what's going on. This is how I see it, or this is how I I know it to be right now. More on this later. And that's why he's doing so much better than Scarce, at least in video views a month, and uh, I want to say overall as a channel. Not that there's nothing wrong with Scarce, but it was just a whole lot of nothing being said for a really long time. Well, and, and you know, with all three of these two, like Scarce, well, maybe I, I, I should say I don't know much about Scarce, but with Leafy and at least Keemstar, uh, they were still around, and they were big right before the monetization cut hit. Yeah. Um, so they made a lot of money. I, if I remember right, Leafy got hacked, and they were like, he's got like two million bucks. Leafy, Leafy made um, in June 2016. This is from a, somebody that I know that knows him. He made like uh, $143,000 in a month that month, 
Um, he made over uh, shit. I, I don't even want to say the number, but he he made a lot of money. Yeah, a, a lot of money. So I mean, a lot of money. If if I were Leafy, I mean, yeah, I'd be pissed off that Idubs nailed my ass and that my numbers have dropped off. But at the end of the day, mm-hmm. you're sitting on millions of dollars. So who really gives a fuck? Literally, and you're and yeah, what, he, he 23. Yeah, he's set for life. He he will never have to work for the rest of his life. He'll have a very comfortable, happy a life. He'll be able to buy a house that he wants, a car yeah, that he yeah. wants, do whatever he wants. You should probably move out of Seattle then, because that's just expensive as fuck. So, I mean, from my perspective, yeah, again, it sucks that uh, his his channel went to shit after iDubs roasted him. Yeah. But at the end of the day, what you know, it, he's not going to give a shit in two years. He'll look at his bank account no. and be like, whatever. You know, I, yeah, I, well, I made a shit of ton course. of cash. Yeah. Now, if he's not getting hit with the uh, the monetization sh- things, like he's still making like ten grand a month. I mean, even if know? he if he even if he is getting hit with it, he's still he's, so far ahead financially that he doesn't have to worry about it. Now, anybody trying to do what they do, like a Keemstar or a Leafy or a, a Scarce or whatever, now mm-hmm. uh, will will never hit that. They will never make that kind of money because monetization will not be their option. So they'll either have to do Patreon, which is risky, sell merchandise, which might work for a while, but it's limited, or sell to a network. Uh, you know, sell to a network might might have some benefits, but they'll probably have to do like independent sponsorships. And I don't know who's going to sponsor that kind of content. It's going to have to be a company that's not going to pay out a lot. So I don't think we're going to see a lot of YouTube millionaires based off the content that has been standard for the last decade. It's going to have right. to be something completely different or something really mundane and tepid. And that's why I really, um, I mean, if, I start putting out consistent videos. My biggest thing is like, I really would like to move to a different platform. Like I would like to just do live entertainment, live Twitch stuff because I enjoy interacting constantly. Like I like making videos and stuff like that. And I wish that I could just demonetize my videos. Cause I don't really, I don't want to waste t- people's time with ads when I know that I'm not going to make anything off of it. And even if I did, it's like, it doesn't really matter. But like, I enjoy the Twitch side of things. And if you have a decent following, like I, if you, if you put a video out tomorrow that explained how you were going to do Twitch, you know, and, and things like that, and you got some sub emotes made and um, pre-applied for your partner, you know, you would have, you would get so many subscriptions and you would get so many people willing to watch you pretty much do anything, especially if you were uh, engaging constantly. Um, and I think that that's where it's kind of moving to is like the Twitch is, is going to be the next monetizable platform because um, everything's live. Uh, advertisers have no fucking choice at, right now. They have no choice but to uh, run ads alongside uh, these streams. Yeah, I, I, um, I'd say that's probably going to change. I mean, I, I think Twitch will probably have, maybe I'll give it a two-year window before that really gets hit. Right. Um, but still, two years is not bad. No, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's, it's bad. Uh, you know, from a personal point of view, I'm not really, like I've done streams and stuff before, um, and I, I get decent numbers when I do them. Uh, but it, it's just not the kind of thing that I do. It, t- you know, you have to be a certain kind of personality to be able to sit and like do gameplay, that kind of stuff for yeah, it, it four or five hours. Time. Yeah. And you have to have a good setup. I mean, my, my headset, as you can hear, is really tinny. It's uh, not bad though. It's really not bad. I was surprised. It, I'm really surprised. Well, yeah, it, it's not horrible, but if you're going to listen to it for five hours, it needs to be better. So you need to have a better setup. You need to have all the shit set up, all the software. You need to know that. And, it's a it's a it's a fucking headache. And besides, you know, I have the way my stuff's set up right now. I do videos that interest me. I put them up. I don't want to find myself in a situation where I feel like I have to stream every day because well, you there won't you know yeah. yeah because people are not interested and then you're charging people to watch it and it just yeah you know more power to the people that want to do it and you know God bless your success but it's just not the route that I would go personally. Well, I. Uh... One of the things that I was excited to see is, uh, you know, in the, in the near future is maybe, uh, maybe some of that, maybe, maybe, a, maybe a, an Overwatch stream, you know, something, something to kind of throw that curveball. You, go on, go on some RP servers uh, on GTA and uh, fuck with some some Spurgs because Britbong does it on YouTube. It's fucking hilarious. Um, if you ever get a chance, I'll, I'll send you the video uh, that I'm talking about if you if you haven't seen it already. It's is, is well, yeah. I mean, I, I've I've watched stuff like that in the past. I mean, I used to follow like my got stuff when they would put it out consistently yeah, for yeah. for years and years, and that was always funny as hell. Um, yeah, it, it, again, it's just um, probably not something I do. I mean, I've done one or two gaming streams, and that was always like as a a part of something else, and usually related to E3. It was like a warm up okay. uh, to E3 coverage. Uh, oh, so you so you did you did that kind of stuff then, huh? Yeah, but it was on YouTube, and it was really right. basic games like Honey Pop or, um, <laughs> you know, shit related to that, yeah. uh, stuff I liked, because uh, I liked Bejeweled, so Honey Pop worked really well for that. 
um, just just kind of stuff like that. But yeah, I I wouldn't um, I I wouldn't do. I think the only person I and I don't really hang out on Twitch much. Uh, the only person mm -hmm. I really watch over there is Harmful Opinions. Yeah, um, yeah. And, I yeah, and and I like his streams because they're funny and um, he usually gets up to some uh, mischievous shit. And it's weird watching Notch consistently go in there and talk to him. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he'll be he'll be playing a game like he was screwing with some kid in uh, like a Gary's mod game. I don't I don't know what he was playing, but uh, the kid was, he got the kid to shit talk uh, Notch as Notch was in the chat room. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> some little ten year olds making fun of him. It was really bizarre. What's it called? Um, Notch. Uh, Notch is he's a pretty interesting guy if you've uh, followed him on Twitter this last two years. Yeah, yeah, he's he's uh, he's, he's got the I don't give a fuck money. Yeah, I was about to say that he's got he's a, he's uh been increasingly more and more I don't give a fuck. Yep, it shows it shows <laughs> very hard through his Twitter. Once you get that kind of level of cash, yeah, you can enter the I don't give a fuck mode where you can say whatever you want to whoever you want without any repercussions and say <laughs> you're gonna take my money. <laughs> it's it's a fantastic position to be in. Yeah, I yeah. bet. I, I, I'd I'd love to have be in that position. I'd love to have. I don't give a fuck <laughs> Everybody would love to be in that position. <laughs> um, but it's fucking been like an hour and a half. I appreciate your time, and um, you know maybe maybe one one day have something a little bit more uh, more interesting prepared. Something else going on in the world that uh, we're both on equal on equal terms to talk about. It'd be pretty pretty cool to get back in here. Maybe in like a month or two, see what other kind of shit's stirring in the world. Yeah, any any time, man. Uh, it's it's been fun. Yeah, anytime you want, uh, just uh, hit me up and we'll we'll do another uh, conversation, another podcast slash stream. Yeah, um, yeah, not not a big deal. That's usually what these are like. Uh, it, it's just kind of shooting the shit for an hour to two hours and talking about various topics. So it's, and, that, it's and that's what I like. I'm gonna end here. Stop. <laughs>